person. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Kinesis HR Corner. I'm so excited that you guys are here joining us here tonight. Um, it is Sunday, November uh, 12th, and Kinesis HR Corner, our topic tonight is a career as a doctor. Um, so welcome. My sister, Dr. Deline Muselak, is uh, going to be joining me in a few minutes. She's putting her triplets to sleep there. If you hear a foot steps all over the upstairs. It's my trying to put her children to sleep. So tonight, before the video starts, if you know of anybody who wants to eventually become a doctor, um, if you have nieces, nephews, children, yourself that you want, I just heard the other day there's a woman, 54-year-old woman who wants to go to medical school and nobody was accepting her into medical school. So she um, decided to go overseas and study, but she's 54 and planning to go to medical school. So share this video because I'm going to cover some questions specifically about um, if you're planning to become a doctor, if you know somebody who wants to become a doctor, these are the intricate questions that you may not be able to get answered anywhere else except from a doctor themselves. So share the video with the person. Call up your friend, text your friends, text whoever, and say, listen, you need to join Kinesis um, Etoro, or you can go to my consulting page, which is Kinesis um, Etoro HR Consulting, or the Ambition Program, so one of those. So she should be here down shortly. So a little bit about my sister. Um, she is a doctor, has been a doctor for a number of years so far, and thoroughly enjoys it. So I'm going to go through with her tonight kind of the whole process of what made her decide to become a doctor and how she went through from undergrad to grad school, then deciding on what she's going to specialize in. Um, and then I'm going to talk about kind of the salaries. There you go. Where, where are you going? She's running away from me, so um, she's trying to get her babies to go to sleep, So, um, but I don't know what's going on. But anywho, um, you want to definitely share this video. So share the video, and I'm going to be going through kind of salary, what, what made you decide. You can't turn on the TV. <laughs> uh, so we have an audience here listening to the video. So Dr. Delene, are you ready? Okay, she's like, she said she needs one second. So um, my audience here is waiting. So share the video. Share the video, please. This is to help anybody out there. We need more doctors in this world, and it's great to have female doctors. Um, her, She's going to answer questions, I'm sure, about her husband, who's a surgeon. So I'm sure she's going to answer questions. Unfortunately, he's not going to be able to sit in on the show because they are putting the triplets to sleep. They have 23-month-old uh, triplets so two boys and a girl and um so he is very him um, my brother-in-law is very hands-on and he's really helping her so there she is so ladies and gentlemen welcome my sister dr delian Mushalak. Hello. so here we are on facebook and then we're also on instagram so <laughs> So, uh, Delian, you know, my show is Kinesis HR Corner. What we're going to talk about today is, um, come in a little bit. maybe I should come in a little bit more. Yes, my, my sweatshirt says best weekend ever because we did have a great weekend. Um, so we, I wanted to you to tell everyone that kind of listened to the show and for people hey, to... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we want to hear your questions. I have a few questions that people have already asked, but what I want to cover tonight is if anybody has any sisters, brothers, uh, children, um, cousins, nieces, nephews that want to be a doctor, they can share this video because we're going to talk a little bit more and you can help them understand kind of this whole process of becoming a doctor. So Delene, what made you decide to become a doctor? So I became a doctor because one, um, since I was little, I always wanted to become a doctor. I think grandma played a big role in it, uh, because somebody here was a little lazy and didn't want to help grandma. <laughs> I always help grandma check her sugars, um, get her pills out. And I just really enjoyed that. And, um, second of all, I think God always just placed it on my heart because I always had that desire to be a doctor. Even up to now, mom always tells people from the time I was little, I would always say I'm going to be a doctor when I grow up and I just pursued it. So you enjoy it right now? I do. 
<laughs> well, take us through the process because I'm sure there's going to be people that are going to watch this video and they may have kids or maybe they could be young kids that are not even in high school or not even in college yet. I know it's only you've always wanted to be a doctor even before you got to like high school and kind of college. So tell me kind of what's the process after you graduate? What what should somebody who's right now in high school, what, what should they be looking towards or planning towards if they're planning on becoming a doctor? Yeah, so one thing I will say, of course, the sooner you know, the better, because it is just a long process becoming a physician. Um, but I also will say people who I went to school with in med school had other careers before becoming physicians and going to med school. So there was a variety of ages. So from, you know, people in their 20s, like myself, to 30s, 40s, or oldest person in our class was in their 50s and they had their own career but decided that that wasn't for them so don't think that you know if you're already doing something and you feel in your heart that you want to be a physician you can't because you can always go back to school so what I would encourage you to do if you're in high school and even if you have another career what happens is um, you end up applying for college and just, you know, you can major in anything you want to major in. For, As their undergrad for their exactly. first four years. Mm -hmm. Can somebody go and get an associate's degree, then go for their four year? Like, do you do you feel that that's something they shouldn't do? Or should they apply directly to a four year university or college? No, you could because most associates you can transfer to a four year program. And I know some people do associate degrees because of financial situations. That is, it's more expensive initially to get into a bachelor um, program. So if you're in a situation where it's easier and um, less, you know, burdensome on your pockets to do an associate's first, but remember, you still would have to do that four years in anyway. So in it's, it's an additional yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Does it matter? You said so you, you want to go and do your undergrad. So does it matter if I go to Columbia University here in New York? Does it have to be an Ivy League or can I go to a Hunter College or maybe a CUNY or a state level school where the tuition is like less than 10 grand a year. So of course, no matter what, you know, um, people are very uh, stereotypical. And as soon as they see something, they're like, oh, but I learned something from a physician. I uh, used to work at a physical therapy office that was owned by a pediatric neurologist who is a physician. And he told me, he said, don't spend all your money on what college or university you go to for your undergrad because nobody will ever ask you where you went to undergrad by the time you're finished training. What will matter in the end would be where you did your residency and your hands-on training. Okay. So my you know, advice to you is if you don't want to end up with three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 worth of loans, if you have an in-state, like I went to in-state university, um, so don't think that you have to move out of state and go to like Emory or something like that. If you can, awesome. If you get a scholarship, even better. Um, and that's something on the side too that, you know, always remember you don't have to have a school scholarship to get scholarships. I got grants and stuff just from writing essays and things like that from different associations. Okay. So you said, so going back to, what did you does it matter what you major and minor in for your undergrad so no it doesn't um you could be a arts liberal arts major if you want um the key thing is that you want to make sure that your counselor knows that you're doing pre-med because there's just pre-medical uh prerequisites that you have to take so you have to take like x amount of biology organic chemistry physics math things like that. A lot of people end up just majoring in biology because you know you'll fulfill all your requirements if you do that. But um, for example, I majored in psychology and minored in biology. Um, so. I remember you told me that you want to, like maybe it's better for people when they're undergrad to, to study something that they're really good at and that way you're getting amazing grades. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, with that, that's positive. And then the other thing, too, they'll look at your grades for, obviously, your pre-med requisites because 
that'll kind of tell you how you'll do in med school. I'm going to pause right here and tell you guys to, for those of you guys joining on the show on Instagram and Facebook, please share the video. If you know anybody who um, in, is needs to study or want to study medicine and want to become a physician, doesn't matter how old they are, this video is for everybody. So, the, so after you finish your undergrad, what do you do next? Do you have to take a certain test in order to go to grad school? To take to go. Did to you take the MCATs? That's to go to. That's before med school. Okay. To get into med school, so to go before going to undergrad or college, you can do your um, ACTs or SAT. Right. Is what okay. you want to do, and then they score off of that. Um, so after you finish your undergrad, what's next? After you finish your undergrad, um, so about your junior year, you take your MCAT, um, and that's the medical entrance exam. Pretty much, and then then you start applying for your medical schools, and those scores determine which medical schools are like. It's like the a ACTs and the SATs determine how they accept you into their medical school yeah, program. Yes, so, so that plays a role in addition to your your CV slash resume, um, outside activities, things like that, and then okay. of course your GPA in okay. undergrad. Okay, so when you go off to medical school, it's another four years. Yes, and with that, I will say there are some programs that are seven-year programs that are combined um, undergrad where they chop the undergrad into three instead of four years and then add medical school. So instead of a total of eight years for four undergrad, four um, medical school, they'll do it in seven. I will say one downfall of that that has come out of those programs is most of the times they don't feel the students are mature. Um, when they start their clinical rotations and stuff. Um, plus, I think it's, it's very rigorous. So, you know, that's up to you. Another aside would be um, one thing I've heard from some other people who have gone to medical school and become doctors is taking a year off, you know, after oh, from their undergrad. high school or between oh, undergrad well, yeah, and don't medical take a year school. Off. You can take a, <laughs> you can take a year off if you want. And um, because once you start, you know, it's legit. You know, you're not getting that much time. Pretty much you're not getting any time to travel or do anything else. You know, you've committed yourself to quite a long time of studying and um, this profession. So a lot of people take time off. And again, if you don't have a lot of things um, under your belt, take that year off and just beef up your CV. Do some research, get in right. contact, do some shadowing, volunteer at a hospital, you know, do something just to beef up your resume and all of that. If you really do want to go to medical school, if you are doing something that pertains to that, if, even if you do medical missionary work because you want to travel the year that you're off, you know, you'll kind of kill two birds with one stone with being able to travel and doing medical things too. And at the same time, it'll make your CV look better. Right. So if you guys have any questions or any questions for anybody else, feel free to um, let us know what your questions are. We're definitely going to try to answer them as, as we go through this. So Delene, is there a specific thing that you should be interested in or good at, such, 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 such as biology, chemistry, math? Like what subjects? Because if you suck at those subjects, do you think I could be successful at becoming a doctor? Um, I would definitely say biology... I'm just going to go out there and probably say all of them because if you're not good at those things, when you do things like pharmacology and anatomy and pathophysiology, which is just the long term for how everything works um, in the body, it, it just won't make sense. You'll, you'll just struggle. So I think the reason they make those classes a prerequisite is so that you know that, hey, it's going to be two or three times harder once I get into medical school. Mm -hmm. In addition, that's why they use your grades um, to predict if you'll do well or not. Because if you're not doing well in those basic classes in college, you probably will struggle a little bit. Now, with that being said, that doesn't mean you won't make it because no matter what, if you persevere and study and do really hard, you'd be okay. But, um, food for thought if you're not doing well at undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a doctor. Um, talk to us a little bit about the MCATs. How did you go about studying the MCATs to um, to really ace it after? So, so the MCATs, so I did a uh, Kaplan has, okay. Kaplan has their book. 
And um, did you actually do courses? They with had, Kaplan? I did do a Kaplan course for MCAT, and I thought they were good. And I'm sure now, I think my I'm a more uh, live in person class person, but all the courses now they offer online that you kind of do it at your own pace and stuff. So I think you can decide if you prefer to learn in person versus if you just want to do it at your own pace. And okay. then um, the other thing, whether, and this is just in general, just some advice, whether and whatever you're doing is to just do practice questions because you can sit down and study stuff and memorize it. But if you don't know how to apply it, you know, it's just, memories that are useless if you can't apply it so practice questions practice questions so then after you graduated from med school um what made you at what point did you decide to specialize in the areas that you're specialized in now so i always knew i wanted to be a pediatrician uh i taught sunday school when i was younger and i love babies they're just awesome and kids are awesome but then when I was in medical school, I did my internal medicine rotation, and that is just strictly adults. It's 18, age 18 and above. Um, and I really enjoyed that rotation. So that guy who was the internist, he's one of my mentors. Shout out to Dr. Sheff, one of the best mentors ever. Um, Initially, he told me maybe I should pursue family medicine because I would get a mix of uh, kids and adults, but family medicine wasn't really my thing just because um, they also do a little bit like the old school family medicine doctors do a little bit of obstetrics, which I'm just not interested in that. Um, and then there's a newer specialty is what I decided to go into, which is a combined boarded um, specialty of internal medicine and pediatrics. So pretty much I, I just boarded in uh, both specialties. So what specialty um, right now is kind of like the top specialty 2017 going into 2018? Top is in, in, in money. To what? Money? I'd probably say um, <laughs> you that, that's a little tricky because I think there's a lot of things that go into it because one, it depends on how hard you work because, you know, you can say, for example, probably it's how is like an orthopedic surgeon would make good money. An orthopedic um, surgeon is the one who's fi who fixes my ankle. That's the one who does bones. Okay. Yeah. All right. You break um, something, they fix it. But, um, for example, general surgery makes good money, but if you're doing six cases a week obviously you won't make more than somebody who's making who's doing 20 cases a week um so that's so that's like a tricky question to say because you have some family medicine doctors who make less and then you have family medicine doctors who probably make close to a million dollars but it's just kind of just how hard you're working and your clientele okay so after you finish grad, uh, your medical school, you then move on. So you just did four years in undergrad, four years in medical school. What's next? So after that, towards the end of medical school, which I did in three and a half, by the way. She did it in three and a half, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, pretty much the same thing when you're towards the end, like a third year in med school, you start deciding what you want to do. Um, and the way most med schools are set up is your first and second year you do mostly uh coursework so again that's pharmacology mm -hmm. anatomy pathophys all that stuff and then third and fourth year is when you're really just hands-on in the hospital and third year is kind of when they let you do the foundational um specialties and fourth year you get to pick like for example if you were interested in surgery in your third year, but then there's, you know, 10 or 12 different surgical specialties. So what you could do in your fourth year is go through orthopedics, you could do eye surgery, urology, you know, plastic surgery, and then kind of narrow down what you want to do. Um, and that's your residency? That's no, this is still med school. It's still med school. Okay. When you're trying to decide. So towards the end of med school, you do need to know what you want to, okay. to do. You can switch for residency. However, it's much harder because the way that what is called the match for residency, the way it's set up, it's really tricky to 
do that whole thing and reapply for it. So I would for sure say when you decide what you want to do, try to make it a final decision. Of course, unless you're very unhappy. Okay. Okay. And then how long is residency? So the shortest residencies are three years. Um, and as a resident, tell tell the viewers who may not know what 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 residency um, comprises of. So if you've ever been to a university hospital, I'm sure you've had interns and residents see you. Um, pretty much residency is your hands-on training. After you complete medical school, you have an MD, your medical physician, your medical doctor after medical school. But haven't taken the boards yet. No, you no because so you're a medical doctor, but you're not boarded. Boarded, right? Yet. Okay. Um, so you can't be boarded until the residency. You can't be boarded until after residency. Okay. Um, so the shortest one is three years, and the longest ones could go. And it all just depends what you do, because some people will train up to like 10, 12 years, and that this is after um, medical school. This is just all residency. Mm -hmm. After residency, if you decide to subspecialize, that's called a fellowship. Now, going back to residency, if you've ever been to a university or academic um, hospital, usually you'll have an intern, and an intern is pretty much it's a resident, but it's just their first year of residency. Mm. So I don't like just them so touching coming out way, scratch. Know. They do, they do all this scut work. It's all scut work, which is running things. You're everybody's telling you what to do, and you're just doing what everybody tells you. Um, and then at second year, that's when you become a resident. And just depending on how long your residency is, then you become senior resident. So you're the one who's bossing everybody around. Okay. Um, so that's how it works. So an intern is a resident. It's just, it's their first year of residency. Okay. And how long is the residency? Just, you said it depends on what they're specializing yes. in. Yes. Okay. Got it. You're done with residency. How do you go about now finding a job? Okay. So I'll just backtrack a little. Let's say you're in residency and um, let's say if you were um, a, just a straight pediatrician, but you wanted to become a pediatric heart surgeon or pediatric heart doctor, a cardiologist. So you would do three years of pediatrics, which would be your pediatric residency. And then your fellowship is what would be next in cardiology. And that would be an additional three years. So if you want to subspecialize, once again, it's kind of like residency. You really want to make sure that that decision is final because, again, you can always quit, but on your resume, that won't look good if, if you start something and all of a sudden you quit because they'll, you know, those of you are like, why did you do that? And that wouldn't be a good reflection on you. Um, once you're done, again, usually, um, Residency, one good thing about being a physician is people always want you. No matter, you're just in high demand and you're the ones who, you're, you're, you've got the biggest bargaining chip uh, when you're making your contract and things like that because people want you. Um, there is a high demand for physicians. I will say especially for Primary care, and just to clarify, primary care includes family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, um, even general surgery. What's happened is they've come up with all these subspecialists, and a lot of people have ended up subspecializing, and there's been this oversaturation of uh, these subspecialists and a lack of just primary care physicians. Um, so it's primary care doctors. Um, you're in high demand. So so a lot of people end up soliciting you. So I remember my my third year in uh, residency, I was already getting emails from companies asking me to uh, uh, see if I would interview for jobs and what location I was looking at. So if you know a location that you want, you can go ahead and reach out to the hospitals in that location if you're kind of like, oh, I'm just going to look for whatever job pays the best. <laughs> you know, you can just wait and see what comes your way. Okay. Do you get paid as a resident? You do. Mm -hmm. What's the average salary that so a resident the average salary, get? I'd probably say, starts out at, um, I think it's different for each program. I'm going to go with probably like 50 to maybe 55,000. Okay. And then each year that goes up 
by, I believe it was like 2000. So maybe if you started off at like 52, then it would be 54,000. It's not, it's not horrible at all. Cause that's way above what the average American makes. Um, I think the thing that makes it a little tricky is the fact that you're just working. It's funny because they did a study about it and a resident because of the hours we work as residents, I think you're getting paid like a dollar and eight cents an hour because we just, we just work that hard and the hours we work are so long, even though our annual salary is higher than the average American. So how many hours does a resident usually work? So um, right now they do have a, uh, guidelines that <laughs> we're not supposed to be going over um, a certain amount of hours. So it shouldn't be over about uh, 80 hours a week. Um, okay. They, the, what they try to do is make that you can't work more than 16 hours straight is what they try to make. So you can't work more than a 16 hour shift at one time um, because again, studies that they've done said it's the same as being intoxicated so obviously you don't want anybody who's uh, <laughs> intoxicated. Come here. At the same level of being intoxicated. I mean, check your blood pressure. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so they do cut that, but I will say, you know, um, just off the record that, um, you know, I know I, I used to say just because, you know, what we call learning opportunities, if something walked in that door and you don't know if you're ever going to see that again, that's a learning opportunity. So pretty much, I just wouldn't record those hours because I'm like, I want to stay and get my hands dirty and learn. Um, and it's just a sacrifice you make so that you become a better doctor in the future. Um, and I mean, there were residents who would leave, they would stick to that time frame, but you could see in the reflection of how they performed versus, you know, people who sacrificed a little bit more time to work a little harder. So your husband, um, uh, Matt is a surgeon. Yes. So is there more time that he did that he had to do more training? Yeah. So because he's general surgeon. He's general surgery. So um so my training was a combined internal medicine and pediatrics. So um if you did internal medicine or pediatrics, each one um is uh three years each, so it'd be six years total. But my training, since it was combined, was four years total, so it was six years squished into four. It's very rigorous, um, you have to work really hard uh, for it because you're trying to learn what people are in six years and four years. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt's training, so for general surgery, it's five years mm -hmm. um, that he did his training for. And then, of course, you so five can, years after undergrad, so undergrad four. Five years after med school. Five years after yeah. med school. So, guys, general surgery. He mm -hmm. went to my brother-in-law went four years undergrad, four years medical school, and then an additional five years five years. After surgery, yes. Nine years. Nine years. <laughs> but I'm assuming he makes more money than you do. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Be yeah. better be more money than us. Yeah. The, uh, okay. So, um, is it significantly more than a general doctor like yourself or a surgeon? Because yeah. I'm looking at so yeah. if there's students here that want to become just a doctor and some are comp contemplating being a surgeon, obviously money is a huge factor. You want to do something. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, but again. But again, I will say there's he has partners who don't work as hard, and I make more money mm. than them. Okay, because you know, I mean you're seeing more patients. Yeah, and like that. yeah. So we're at the point now where you graduate, you have a job, you were solicited. You were telling the audience that that um, that either hospitals solicit you or companies solicit you to come on board. Um, how? What's your thoughts about going into kind of your own private practice when you graduate? Um. I think unless you have a, a family member who's already a physician or a good friend um, that you could potentially, who has already graduated and been out for a little bit to mentor you, I think going straight into private practice would be difficult because unfortunately one thing in med school is they don't teach you the business aspects of medicine, mm -hmm. things like billing, things like if you do open your own practice, you know, what are your responsibilities? So just to give you um, an example, if you do decide to open your own practice, one, you have to 
foot the cost for the building, all the equipment. So you're talking about exam tables, all of the equipment to take care of your patients. Um, remember when you get paid, so let's say in a month you get $500,000, you know, obviously you get taxed on that, number one. Two, you have to pay your malpractice insurance. You have to pay all of your staff members. You have to pay for the cost of the facility, including AC, heat, light, whatever, yeah, whatever costs you have. And then whatever is left goes to you. Right. Um, so I think coming straight out of residency, it's a huge step to do that. Whereas if you're employed, either by a corporation or a hospital, um, you know, they're the ones paying your staff. They're the ones who pay for your malpractice. So you don't really have to worry about all of that. So personally, and this is just me, I mean, and, hey, if that's what you want to do, that's you. But for me, um, I think it would be better to come out, practice a little, be right. employed to kind of see how things work, how you would do things in the future and how you wouldn't do things um, just so you can learn the ropes a little instead of just jumping into it. Okay. So, Dylan, how long have you been a doctor and a pediatrician I've slash been internist? I've physician now for four years. Four years. What well, are, that's from residency, out of residency, yeah. Tell, tell the audience out there, students who are planning on becoming a doctor, would love to become a doctor. What are the challenges now that you've gone through all of this schooling, all of the residency? And I remember when you were a resident, how much work it was and how much you complained when it was going to be over. And she didn't complain. Um, and dad kept like encouraging you that the soon will be over. It'll be over soon. Now that you're an actual doctor, four years in your career, what are you laughing at? <laughs> uh, what are the challenges? Um, the world. <laughs> well, I think some of the challenges are, um, I think just juggling everybody. It's, it's unfortunate. Um, I call it the government, but the system um, just uh, puts a lot of demands on physicians. Like you're expected to see X amount of patients. I really feel I would have been a really, really good old school physician where you could just sit and chat with your patients for an hour and like really get to know the family. And that's one reason I did primary care because I, I love to have that rapport with my patients. Um, but now it's almost like they want your clinic or even the hospital to be a little factory where you're just pushing people in and out. Because even in the hospital, if I have a patient admitted, you know, the administration is like, why do you still have the patient in the hospital? Because the insurance company, you know, is Only asking. Pays for a certain yeah, because they're like, this isn't going on. That's not going on. Why are you keeping the patient here? Um, so, so that's one thing that gets a little tricky because I feel as a physician, there's a lot of other factors dictating how I practice as a physician. Um, so it's difficult to provide the quality of care that I truly want to provide when there's all these restraints. Um, two, I think just a family, I will say being a female physician is much harder than being a male physician. Um, I really love critical care, the ICU world, but with Matt being a general surgeon, there's no way that um, we would have been able to have a family. We probably wouldn't have gotten blessed with our triplets if uh, that was the case, because then both of us would probably just be on call every other day and it, it would just be, I mean, it's already tough as it is because I have call and Matt takes call too, but it would be even harder um, on us. So I think I will say to any female considering medicine, it is unfortunate, but in this day and age, you really do have to choose if you, if your family comes first or your profession, because you do have to sacrifice something, um, when you, ha when you have a family and when you have children. So, um, so it gets a little tricky as, as a female. Okay. Um, well, you had talked about the, the hospitals. People usually complain whenever they go see their doctor. There's always a long wait. Mm -hmm. Doctors are never on time. Um, why is it that way? Is it because you guys are slow? No. <laughs> so there's a lot of factors to number no. one. So for, so for myself, one thing that plays a role is I practice what is considered traditional medicine. So I 
Um, I'm in my own clinic by myself. And then I also admit my own patients. So I see my own babies, my own kids who have been admitted to the hospital and my own adults who have been admitted to the hospital. So if you are my patient in my office, if you get admitted to the hospital, I'm the physician seeing you. Whereas some physicians now only practice in their office and they don't go to the hospital at all. So I'm a little glutton for punishment here um, doing, doing both. Uh, so for me in the morning, if I have a sick patient and it takes me longer with that patient, and if I'm late to clinic, I mean, there's no way I can make that time up because I've already gotten there late and I already have patients waiting for me. Some other factors that play a role is, you know, let's say somebody's just coming in for a blood pressure check. And as I'm leaving, this happens all the time, not with this complaint, but as you're turning that door handle, it's like, oh, and by the way, I've been having chest pain or doc, I saw some blood in my stool. Um, those are things it's my responsibility to make sure that the patient is okay and they don't drop down when they leave my office. Um, so so, so that, puts, that puts you behind too, because then you do have to address that problem if, if the patient does mention something that's concerning. Other things that, unfortunately, I think some patients don't understand, and I know a lot of offices have a, um, a late policy, so if you're X amount of minutes late, you have to reschedule your, your appointment, and I know on my end, some patients get upset because there's other factors that play a role in them being late. However, you know, we, need have, we have to show up to work on time. We show up to other places on time. So you have this appointment and you knew you had this appointment. So if somebody shows up late, that puts me behind too. Um, okay. So it's not really your so fault. Is yeah, what you're it's, to say. It's, not, it's not always the doctor's <laughs> fault. I'm just saying. Okay. Um, somebody had asked me a question. I wrote it down on my list here. What are the joys of being a doctor? Because it's so demanding. And as a female, with as a family, and not only just a family, you have three kids that are all the same age. Yeah. But so what brings you joy to go into your clinic every day? Um, I'd probably say the thing that bring probably two, the two biggest things. Number one would be um, when you get a diagnosis and you know that you just saved somebody's life. Um, that that's a I call it a good a good doctor day. That's what I call it. Um, because that gives you the best feeling that all these years of training that you just made a diagnosis on somebody and saved that person's life because now they're being treated for it and they're not going to die from it. Um, and then number two would be when I get somebody who comes in and let's say they're an uncontrolled diabetic or uncontrolled blood pressure that I change their medicines, I change their treatment, they come back and things look awesome good doctor day because you know again at the end of the day you're saving these people um you're making a difference in their lives and you're trying to help them to live a better quality life for longer okay what's the another person asked the question and if you guys have any questions of yours that are looking right now on instagram on facebook this is your time because we're going to be um, closing up in a few minutes. So if you have any questions, specific questions, you can um, send me a chat or you can write it right here on the live. So um, what's the range of salary would somebody be looking for um, when becoming a doctor? I know it's really broad, but give us an yeah. idea of how much money we're looking at after residency and you start working. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I I probably say if you're going full time, it I will say what makes a huge difference is when you're just starting off versus when you have experience under your belt. That's number one, and then mm -hmm. number two, the other difference is if you're practicing in a private um, setting or corporation versus a university or academic center. So remember, if you're in a private setting, you don't have residents and stuff helping you, so you're doing everything. Whereas when you're in an academic university setting, you have residents, they're writing the notes, they're doing all that stuff, and you're just co-signing everything. Mm -hmm. So a physician who's in an academic slash university setting will make less um, money compared to somebody who's in a private setting. So for example, I'm owned by a private corporation, not a university. However, just to throw things out, if you like to teach, because I love to teach, um, I have students that 
that come and I teach them in my clinic in the hospital. So you still you still can set that up and do that. As far as the salary, I'd probably say probably the lowest. And again, this is probably like the full time. I'd probably say the lowest is probably one fifty to two hundred thousand. And then sky's the limit on that. So that's awesome. You hear yeah. that? You hear that? Anybody out there that wants to be a doctor? Hey, I have a picture of a yacht with a helicopter pad. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do you see yourself in five to ten years in your career? Who? Where are you going? Uh, where am I going? I have lots of things on my uh, list to do in five to ten years. Um, number one being to get these babies potty trained. <laughs> We have started that. If anybody has any recommendations on that, um, it's going okay though. They can poop in the potty. We haven't quite gotten pee pee down yet, but we call it wee wee, by the way. Um, but five to ten years, I would probably see myself um, doing some other. I have some other little projects on the side that I've been working on. Um, one thing I'll encourage people is don't become a slave to other people. Um, as a physician, I will say you work really hard to get where you are and don't let people step on you. Um, don't let people disrespect you as a physician because you've earned that respect by the time commitment and just the, how hard you study to get where you are. So don't let anybody ever put you down um, just during your training and anything like that. But Back to me. Um, so I have a couple little projects that I'm working on um, that I that I would like to do, and they're they're a little sicker right now because I'm still working on. <laughs> um, and uh, I think uh, just just growing. I I really just want to. Um, at the end of the day, both Matt and I do want to do medical missionary work. Um, that's that's one of the reasons that I became a physician is to get into the missionary field. Um, we're trying we're currently working on becoming debt free, and once we become debt free, then it'll be easier to just pick up and travel. Especially now that we have the triplets, you know. I, unfortunately, you know, I, we grew up in a family with dad, and I think back in the day it was kind of like you just dropped everything in into <laughs> missionary work, but. Um, but I think we just don't want to leave any burdens on our kids or anything like that, like our medical school loan. So we would like to have all of that paid off before we do medical missionary work. But ideally, that's that's what we would love to do. Um, I am working on uh, Kenise and I are pretty awesome. We're going to have our own talk show soon. What, what? <laughs> Well, I have many talk shows at this point. So, I have Kenisa's so, HR Corner. I'm so, having a relationship talk show in January. So I'm going to be starting um, something about education for pediatrics. I feel, you know, there's uh, Dr. Phil, there's uh, Dr. Oz. And so you're going to be like really... the Indian version of Doc McStuffins. Yes. Yeah. I know I look like Doc McStuffins right now. <laughs> Doc McStuffins. Time for your checkup. Time for your checkup. I'm gonna check you. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> and last question, Deline, is what what words of encouragement do you have? Because I remember when you were studying in medical school and you saw, and I know it bothers you and Matt a lot when you guys see like doctors who are obese, doctors who smoke, doctors. I remember when you were in medical school that you know there was a lot of the doctors to be that would go out and like totally get wasted. Um, and, you know, I know a lot of like friends that, that are our doctors who, you know, they do illegal drugs and they do all these things. And I know that really bothered you guys. Um, I went to a neurologist recently and he, he was so overweight that he was breathing <laughs> so heavily. And during, he was like, when he was writing my prescription, he's like, I'm like, out of breath, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just picking up the pen, he was like breathing <laughs> heavily, writing the prescription. So, um, what words 
do you have for somebody who's going to pursue this world of medicine? And you talked about the joys of helping that you enjoy this field. It's because you get to save somebody's life. What do you, what encouragement do you have for people out there that want to study medicine? Um, so my encouragement for you, uh, regardless, even if it's medicine or something else, you know, number one, do, do what you love. Because the thing that's going to make you persevere and keep going, how, how come I don't have a glass of water? What kind of show is this? <laughs> I'm off duty now. I'm not saving your life. <laughs> you have a disease or nothing? <laughs> okay, don't sorry. Need that <laughs> um, if it's something you love, it's really that love. Who's laughing at <laughs> Let's try Pastor Carrie. <laughs> Pastor Carrie. Pastor Carrie, are you laughing? <laughs> oh, Jonathan over there. It's just a Sharmala. Um, but uh, but do what you love because it's that it's that you, it's your inner desire that's going to cause you to really get through it and you know be surrounded by people who support you. One thing is Kenny's brought up that I used to complain. It's hard, I'm not gonna lie. Medical school is hard. Residency school is hard. You're you're working day and night. I remember studying, staying up and studying. If I had a test at seven, I would be studying until like four or five, and then sleep for a couple of hours, and then wake up and go take my test. Um, so it takes a lot of dedication. And one thing Mom always used to say to me is that this is your last lab. And all I know is I've been on the last lab forever. It was the <laughs> longest last lab that my mom ever had me do. But you know, just her saying that at least put a little hope that yes, that's it. You know, when I pass this test or when I do this, that's right. I'm one step closer to becoming a doctor. I'm one step closer to being boarded in what I love. So I will say, you know, just be around people who support you before you make any decisions pray really really hard i mean even though i was saying i wanted to be a doctor i had gotten multiple prophecies about becoming a physician and traveling there's even prophecies that in on my life that haven't been fulfilled yet and i know like going to africa and practice being a medical missionary in in africa and that hasn't been fulfilled yet but you know it's in his time that it will happen and i don't rush that because maybe god wants me to be prepared for something specific before i go there mm -hmm. um so definitely just pray about it before you do it and that's in regards to anything again whether it's being a physician or not and then the last thing is just remember that, you know, the scripture I live by is, Jer is in Jeremiah that for he knows the plans that he has for you and all of his plans are for you to prosper and to have favor and not to cause you no hope, no dismay, nothing like that. God wants you to succeed. He already has everything laid out, even during times when it's awful when I'm like, oh my gosh, who decided to become a doctor? These patients are so ungrateful. I know that God specifically chose me to do this for a reason. The days that I know he did is when a patient comes in and is like, I'm so glad that you're my doctor or you always take that time. And I know the other day, Kenise went to a physician and she was like, do you sit down and talk to your patients? And I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm sitting and talking, but a lot of people unfortunately get sucked up in medicine and just try to rush the visit, but it's not all about that. And I, and I will say for me personally, going back to how I see myself in five to 10 years, I've always prayed for God for these hands to have the gift of healing. And I'm still praying about that and that God will use me, you know, not only like physically as a physician, but also spiritually as a physician. And I think whatever you go into, just make sure that that's the plan that God has for you, that, you know, he can use you both in this true realm, but also in the spiritual realm in whatever you do. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I just have one last question and then we're going to end the show. Um, I think we've answered most of the questions because I don't see any other questions popping up. So I'm just going to, that, I'm just going to switch it really quick. Adeline, thank you so much for talking about a career as a doctor and helping anybody who wants to study as a doctor. I'm just going to switch it a little bit. 
um, because there's a lot of people that I see here that are on the live show that I'm sure go to the doctor and you I'm sure would say that everyone should see their primary care physician once a year mm -hmm. and do your routine visit and most insurance companies if you're on insurance it's called your well visit and it's paid a hundred percent you shouldn't mm -hmm. even have to pay a copay um, once a year it's correct am mm -hmm. I wrong okay so I'm right <laughs> I see I do know a little bit um, the last thing is is how do I mean the people that are watching this show just switching it a little bit around how do you really should you interview your own primary care physician how do you select the right primary care physician for you? Yeah, you should. I'm a big proponent about that. One example is um, on my pediatric side, I have something called a prenatal meet and greet. Uh, pretty much it's a visit and no charge and pregnant couples come in and they meet me. They meet my staff. They tour my clinic. Um, pretty much I tell them how my call schedule works, how my clinic schedule works, um, and I encourage them to meet all of the pediatricians and some of my adults do the same because if they switch their kids over they're like hey since you do both I'm thinking about coming over here and I just wanted to meet and talk to you and get your thoughts about this um, because some physicians if, if something happens they don't necessarily do diet and exercise like if you're a diabetic and it's not it's a newly um, diagnosed disease and you don't necessarily have to be on medicine and diet and exercise can change things. Some physicians prefer to do medicine first, whereas some other physicians would say, hey, let's try six months of diet and exercise and check things back in at that time. Um, so I think it is a good idea to um, interview um, your doctors and most offices offer that um, you can just call the office up and say hey I just wanted to see if I can come in and meet the doctor I had a couple of questions and they won't charge us may, for it no, it's not supposed you to guys be hear that. that you can call up a doctor's office and ask to come yeah. in a tour and meet the doctor for free yeah so okay. so it should be they shouldn't charge you for that because once we're not giving medical advice so at those visits I can't give any medical advice um, at those visits. So just, you know, watch your questions because you can't say, what will you specifically do at this? It's more, you know, for example, some parents would say, what if I don't want to vaccinate my children? You know, what are your thoughts on that per se? Or do you even see kids if they're not vaccinated? Or adults who say, hey, if something happens, do you give me a pill for everything? Mm -hmm. um, so just general questions like that. So you can't ask specific medical treatment questions okay. um, for it to be free. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Overhead. <laughs> <laughs> That's Pastor Gary talking about overhead. <laughs> uh, well, listen, thank you guys so much for all uh, day. <laughs> Pastor Gary's like, charge them and then just give it in your guides. <laughs> And the same way you interview your doctor, you should also interview your pastor at your local yeah. church before you choose a local. Excuse me. Can I tour your church, please? <laughs> Um, okay, so thank you guys so much for joining yes. us. The show did go. Don't forget to check me out on my show. I'll be coming out soon. Okay, <laughs> you, that's not supposed to be talking about your show on my show. But anyway, you know, so share this video with anybody who wants to become a doctor. You could, guys can definitely um, Facebook message me if you have any specific questions. If you're not friends with Deline on Facebook, um, definitely send me your questions. I'll be more than happy to send it off to her and I'll respond to it. This is to help you or anybody that you know that wants to go off to medical school. So I hope you guys enjoy the show. Thank you for joining us tonight, this Sunday evening, and we hope that you guys have a great week ahead. Um, wish yeah. you guys all the best. Thanks for joining. Love Don't you. Don't forget, hug your doctor. Hug your we doctor. Love hugs. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.